now our tradition, we try to alternate between something more clinical and something more basic. And this is basic science seminar of the night and from a fantastic lady, Ting Ting, those who are from my lab. Her mentor is my former PhD student, Robin Cho, so she has to be good. <laughs> All right, so I, if anybody is interested, it's, it's right here. But she does really beautiful work on trafficking of uh, connection 43 in particular and uh, ion channel proteins in general to the membrane and the mechanism of how they arrive at the membrane. It's really a fascinating story. Okay, so uh, first of all, we're really uh, happy today to have two of our own. And I call them two of our own. I got permission. And um, I'm not going to dive into the um, history of these two gentlemen except telling you that uh, Phil received his MD, Dr. Kukulich received his MD from Vanderbilt University and then passed through Chicago on his way to, um, to uh, Washington University. And Cliff uh, Robinson, who's here, from uh, Phil's a cardiologist who is uh, doing uh, it, uh, uh, electrophysiology work and treating cardiac arrhythmias. And uh, Cliff is a radiation oncologist. And uh, we come from the same uh, part of the, of the country. Uh, I, I received my PhD from uh, Case Western Reserve University. And Cliff received his MD from Case Western Reserve University a few years after that. And then I think you stayed at the clinic for the fourth time. So I think the nice thing about all of this is really the collaboration. I think it's a great example how two disciplines in medicine uh, can collaborate and also collaborate with us in biomedical engineering to create something new. And I have to say that, you know, I've been working on electrocardiographic imaging, which is an non-invasive method for diagnosis for many, many years, 40 years. And um, a vision right from the beginning was to try and bring things to also non-invasive therapy. So, you know, we stated it in several in our papers and reviews that that is something for the future. But these guys make the future come faster than I expected. So, it's all yours. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Thanks for the invitation. And thank you all for being here. Um, the title of this is Development of an Entirely Non-Invasive Cardiac Ablation Platform. I'm Phil Kuklich here. This is Cliff Robinson. And I'm pretty sure that this is the only time you'll have a cardiologist and a radiation oncologist sharing the stage. So this is, uh, you, you won't see this very often, but maybe you'll see more of it. Who knows? I'm going to do some of the introduction on the front end, then I'll have Cliff come up and, and add uh, as we go along. But in the next 45 minutes or so, this is kind of the overview. I want to talk about what are the unmet needs uh, of uh, arrhythmia here in 2016, particularly ablations, and how we can ablate smarter, as you are alluded. Is there a way to do this harnessing and leveraging the technology that we have now in ways to do better work? We'll go over some of our pilot data and end on some future directions, which I think are particularly exciting. And you know, if we start with quotes, here in electrophysiology in 2016, we are largely destroyers, right? We break things down. But whether you believe Winston Churchill or whether you believe Nelson Mandela, we really should build, not destroy. And so allow me two, three slides to just say we should be building some of these things instead of continuing to ablate and destroy. And so what is treatment? What is you know ablation versus real treatment? Well, in cardiac electrophysiology, we're different than any other specialty or subspecialty within cardiology. Uh, there are those who open up arteries when people have heart attacks, and so they go into the arteries and they open up these stents within uh, the, the blood vessels and they restore blood flow. So treatment to a myocyte looks like this, restoring some blood flow, handing something that is good back to the myocyte. How about heart failure doctors? Heart failure doctors offer treatment. They strengthen the myocytes. They take diseased, ill myocytes. And so to a myocyte, this is what a heart failure doctor looks like. It says, let's get stronger, let's do better. What about to cardiac imagers, to people who do CAT scans or ultrasounds? Well, this is kind of what the cardiac myocyte looks like, walking the, 
in a red carpet with paparazzi, take pictures of me, I'm a beautiful cardiac myocyte. But what about in cardiac electrophysiology? What are we doing in 2016? We're mean. We're not good to cardiac myocytes. We systematically hunt and destroy them. We mercilessly and intentionally burn or freeze these with the hopes, and, and we even send robots into the heart and can control them uh, remotely there to try to destroy. And so I want to at least throw out there that we're going to spend most of our time talking about destruction and elevating the level of destruction, but it's always worth thinking about how we can rebuild. And there are many ways within cardiac electric physiology that we should be thinking about this. And I might even postulate that maybe some of the things that we do today where we think we are ablating, non-invasively, might actually have some of these effects electrophysiologically, whether that enhances the conduction velocity, whether that prolongs the refractoriness, or does some type of a functional ablation at the level of the cell-cell communication. The goal here is to, if I can show, the goal here, this is kind of a schematic that you'll see again. This is healthy myocardium in red, this is SCAR, and the SCAR is homogeneous, it is not homogeneous, it's heterogeneous, and there are multiple different electrical circuits within this which offer possibilities for us to alter the ability to induce arrhythmias. And so today, in 2016, we still don't build, we are ablationists. We destroy things. And in many ways, cardiac EPs are kind of like radiation oncologists. I see this and I say, how can I ablate the VT? How can I destroy the electrical signals? And Cliff sees this and says, how can I ablate that cancer? So in many ways, even though you've never seen a cardiac or a cardiologist and a radiation oncologist on the same stage, we kind of have similar goals with what we do with our treatments. And so we're going to spend time talking predominantly about VT, ventricular tachycardia. And I compare that to things like atrial fibrillation or other supraventricular tachycardias because in 2016, that's where the greatest needs are. So if we look at the dangers of these different arrhythmias, AFib is not life-threatening. It does increase the risk of a stroke a bit. SVT is not life-threatening, but VT, ventricular tachycardia, is. And fortunately, it's not the most common of the heart rhythm problems. But the risks that are associated with therapy, things like the medicines that we would use, or the defibrillators that you'll hear about, or the catheter ablations we'll talk about, all carry risk. And they carry more risk generally than the other types of diseases. And how good are these? How efficacious are they? Pretty poor. So we aren't very good at preventing and treating ventricular tachycardia. So there's great unmet needs in this region, particularly when it comes to shorter procedures, bigger ablations, better mapping tools. We have a great opportunity here to do some good. When we think about the different kinds of VT, the most common type of VT is from a prior heart attack. And so there is scar that is laid down within this area, and there's usually re-entry, whether that be an ischemic cardiomyopathy or other surgical scars, infiltrative diseases like sarcoidosis and others. There can also be idiopathic or focal type of disease, and that's usually not associated with cardiomyopathies, though it can be. And as I mentioned, VT is life-threatening, and it's life-threatening in a big way. No offense to my radiation oncologist friend, but sudden cardiac death kills roughly 300,000 Americans, and that's more than lung cancer and breast cancer and AIDS combined. And so this is a major issue when we talk about public health. And so those are the types of VT that we deal with, and treatments for these VTs oftentimes has to do with medicines or in particular catheter ablation for the VTs on a structurally normal heart and medicines or an implantable cardiac defibrillator for those with structural heart disease prior SCAR, though increasingly catheter ablation is being used as well. And in particular, defibrillators have really made it so that people live longer with bad hearts. So you can have your SCAR, you can have your VT, and the defibrillators will be called into duty to save a life. Here's an example of a football player who has a defibrillator in. And you'll notice he's the guy who falls down here he has a defibrillator in, it recognizes his VT, it's charging, watch his legs, watch his legs, it just delivered a shock, and he's good, he's ready, he's ready to keep going. So you just watched a man die and be resuscitated from a defibrillator all within the course of about 12 seconds, which I think is pretty spectacular. So the ICD should not be the rescue uh, it should not be the thing that we uh, lean upon because the fibrillators hurt. They're not comfortable. We shouldn't let people die and then be rescued over and over. The ICD is really the parachute, uh, but as Dan Cooper likes to say, let's fix the plane. 
So let's talk a little bit more about fixing the arrhythmia substrate in 2016, that's catheter ablation. So just a brief walk through history. It hasn't been that long since we've been ablating cardiomyopathies. In 1972 was the first EP evaluation of VT with catheters and mapping of the heart. And it was later through the 70s where surgical techniques were, were perfected and used in an effort to carve out the arrhythmic substrate during open heart surgery. And through the course of the 80s, the publication of these uh, was, was done. And they had a fairly effective uh, non-inducible rate. So 72 to 97% acutely effective, but recurrence rates long term about you know a quarter to a third. And unfortunately, you know, 10%, 15%, upwards of 17% of these patients died. So the operative mortality was not trivial. And in the early 90s, we figured out ways to use catheters to deliver energy into the heart. And the first type of energy was direct current. And that was essentially a, an explosion, initially at the AV node and then for VT. And it had high rates of barotrauma and arcing. This was a very difficult energy to control. And so there would be rupture of cardiac tissues and ultimately cause large amount of cardiac dysfunctions and even death. And you saw a three month mortality that again approached 10%. So quite a dangerous sort of way of delivering energy. But on the basis of a catheter, we could think about different ways of delivering energy. And really the standard of care now is radiofrequency energy. So in the mid 90s moving into the late, uh, late I'm sorry, mid 80s moving into the late 80s, radiofrequency energy was used. And this causes a, a local heating, very much like an incandescent light bulb. It causes desiccation of the local tissues. It's very much of a, a sniper type of an ablation. It's, it's a rather small, uh, thermally driven ablation, and it gives very discrete coagulation necrosis. This is kind of a schematic of what one of these catheters would look like that can deliver the energy. Now, the nice part is these catheters not only deliver the energy, they can also be used to map where the arrhythmias are coming from. And so I'll show you kind of what the examples might look like. We can take advantage of some of the other anatomic scans, put a catheter inside the heart, and recreate this in three dimensions. And so this is, I've maneuvered a catheter inside the left atrium and recreated this. And during tachycardia, we can actually sample points. And not only do we have X, Y, Z coordinates of these different areas, but we also have a time coordinate, if you will, an activation mapping. And so we call it 4D mapping, and each one of these points that you might see on here is, a, is associated with some point in time over the course of an RR interval. And we can map within each tachycardia such that purple is late, red is early. And as you take sample many points over the course of an arrhythmia, you can pinpoint down where that arrhythmia is coming from and then heat up your catheter at that tip. Here's the close-up of what one of these radiofrequency ablations looks like. There's the catheter tip into a piece of tissue, and they're heating this up. And at a roughly 60 degree isotherm, you can see the desiccation of tissues. This is what radiofrequency ablation does. And it's highly addictive to fix arrhythmias. It's a lot of fun. Shown here is atrial flutter, and if you put the catheter just in the right spot, and you turn on the radiofrequency ablation, that atrial flutter stops, and we're back in sinus rhythm. So it provides an immediate fix to arrhythmias. And so there's a lot that we have done with radiofrequency ablation over the course of the last two, now three decades, uh, which has really made this the standard of care. But how successful are we really depends on a number of factors, especially the type of arrhythmia. Where are you ablating? If we're ablating in the atrium for a supraventricular tachycardia, we have a terrific acute success rate, very few recurrences down the road. And it's fairly safe and it's fairly short. It's what catheter ablation was made for. As we've extended to other types of arrhythmias, we see that recurrences for atrial fibrillation can be wide ranging and these procedures can be pretty long. And in particular, when we look at structural VT, acute success rates are low, 12 months recurrences are high, adverse events because they are such long procedures. We have the opportunity to improve this group of patients. And so I, I would ask, why does VT recur after ablation? This is more for the ablationists in the room and you could probably rattle these off and you've probably heard these. Now, it wasn't inducible during the study. We put these catheters into the heart. We try to get the VT to start, but it doesn't always start. And now we're left with catheters in the heart and no good target because it's hard to induce. Maybe we don't have the adequate mapping. I, I showed you an example where we're able to move a catheter 70 or 80 points that we'd sampled in the left atrium. But sometimes it takes 400 or 500 or more points to really figure out where your arrhythmia is coming from. Maybe your map was inadequate. Maybe you couldn't get the catheter to certain locations. There are protected regions within the heart. 
maybe when you got your catheter there and delivered the radio frequency energy, you still couldn't deliver the heat to the deeper tissues. We see this in VTs that seem to be coming from areas deeper inside the, the ventricle in particular, in the thicker tissues. Of course, by the time you're done mapping 500 points and ablating certain areas, it's now seven hours into a procedure, you're tired, the patient's had seven hours worth of anesthesia, and they're usually hypotensive. And so long procedures tend to be kind of risky. And it might be that the, the substrate, the ventricular substrate is just too much. There are many different types of VT, many different circuits within that scar. I'll show you a schematic of that. Maybe you tested, but you couldn't recognize the existing circuits, and probably most importantly, the substrate changes over time. So we could fix VT1 and 2 and 3 today, but that scar continues to mature over time such that VT4 shows up three months from now, and it wasn't even available to me at the time of the catheter mapping. So this is what has largely driven our low success rates for ventricular tachycardia. Here's an example of a scar. It's, it's a schematic, but here's a scar with multiple dense areas within it. VT1 wraps around this scar here, and we would say, hey, let's ablate right here. And you can see an ablation here. But now we've got a different circuit that VT2 can go around. And we say, okay, well, let's ablate down here. Well, we've got VT3 and VT4, and this is the sort of game that we play inside patients' hearts on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's very frustrating. And so you might be sitting there saying, can we do better? Maybe we shouldn't be pinpointing all of the different areas. Maybe we could just make it one huge scar and maybe we could take care of all of those VTs together. Well, sometimes there are many regions of scar. This shows up kind of nicely. It's a PET scan. You can kind of see the front of this person. And this is their heart on a PET scan. And each one of those is a metabolically active area. This is a woman with cardiac sarcoidosis. So each of those areas of black it's an area of metabolic activity. It's an area where VT could be coming from. There's many regions of scar, many regions of cardiomyopathy in this woman's heart. Sometimes it's not many regions. Sometimes it's just one really large region. This is an ultrasound from inside the heart, and you can see that this portion of the heart essentially doesn't beat. This up here is squeezing, but the whole apex of this person's heart is not moving. And when we put catheters inside the heart, this whole red area here his scar is low voltage. And so this patient has a really large scar. Maybe there's multiple circuits within that scar. How can I possibly take care of that? What about our mapping? Here's an MRI. This is a really cool case where we had an MRI before and an MRI after an ablation. It was an unsuccessful ablation. And this is kind of the left ventricle shown here. The area here, let's say between 1 and 2 o'clock, is more white. It picked up the gadolinium. That's where the scar is. So the scar is over here at the 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock region. And when this patient had a failed ablation, and we were able to look at the MRI again, you can see these areas of ablation right here in bright white. And you can see that those happened at 12 o'clock. Not on the scar, but next to the scar. And so while we thought we were on it, we were not on it. So the, the mapping is inadequate. Sometimes we can't get the catheters where we want them. Sometimes the coronary arteries get in the way. Here's an example of a catheter that's placed outside the heart and coronary arteries running underneath it. So we might be on the spot that we want, but there are difficult ways for us to apply the energy that we want to in those locations. So can we do better? Let's start thinking about how we can do better. We haven't even talked about the fact that these are often are eight to 10 hour procedures and patients can take a long time to recover from them. And we've had some deaths during these procedures because of this. Um, so can we do better? Well, a couple things that we do nowadays is map in sinus rhythm and look at the electrograms and the different shapes of these electrograms, in particular areas of low voltage, fractionation, and these late potentials that happen after the completion of the activation sequence of the heart. And we can identify these and tag these. The other movement now is to say, should we ablate more or maybe all of the scar? Maybe instead of finding this, the little areas and the critical pieces within the scar, maybe we should circumferentially ablate and essentially isolate that area or put a line across it. Or maybe we ought to just ablate the whole thing as much as we can. Well, do we have any evidence to guide us? Just last year, or actually I think it was early this year that this was published, the VISTA study, and it compared two ways of going about your catheter ablation. The first one was the clinical VT approach where we induced VT, we carefully mapped it, and we performed the ablation in the area that was critical to that VT. That was randomized against the idea of ablating all abnormal signal, finding the scar and ablating all of the scar and homogenizing that. And when those two arms were compared, 
over the course of a year, the substrate-based ablation had about a 15% recurrence rate, and the clinical VT, the, the standard way of doing things, had about a 50%, almost a 50% recurrence rate. Now, these patients were on medicines as well. So I can't say that this is a particularly um, uh, exciting trial in the sense that the numbers kind of stink, but it seems like more ablation seems to be better. Homogenizing that scar seems to be, in a randomized trial, the right way to do this. And so we've moved more and more towards aiming for all of the abnormal signals and not just the little pieces of them. And ultimately, this leads an incomplete result. So this is a, a heart that was taken out of one of our patients who had had endocardial and epicardial ablation. If you look inside, this is the right ventricle, but what I really want to show you is inside the left ventricle. If you look inside here, you see all these white areas. These white areas are areas of ablation. And as we pull open the mitral valve, you see all of this ablation through here, this white area. And we cut across them to see how deep these ablations are. And in fact, we thought we were doing terrific work, but the ablation depth is roughly three millimeters. See here? <laughs> roughly three millimeters. Not the 12 millimeters or the 15 millimeters that we need. It's not a very thick ablation. We were able to roll that around. We did epicardial ablation on the other side of that, and that was even worse. You can see most of this yellow fat, adipose tissue, and it looks like we cooked the fat reasonably well, but the depth of the ablation was minuscule. And so we have incomplete thickness, we have gaps between our ablations, and this is on our very best sort of work. And in, in a, a prospective trial of our best catheter ablationists, there's about a 50% success at six months with a 10% major complication and 3% chance of death. This needs to be better. We should not be comfortable that this is a, a standard of care right now. So what helps us ablate smarter? Obviously, the things that I would want, I would want to be able to see a 12 VDKG and know where the VT is coming from. I would want to look at the local electrograms. I would love to be able to see the electrograms during VT. I would love to be able to see the abnormal electrograms during sinus <coughs> rhythm. If I had all of these things, I think I would do better. If I knew where the scar was, here's that MRI beautifully enhancing a scar on the inferior wall. If I knew where that scar was beforehand, I think I could do better. And of course, we're developing better catheters, things that can sense force, things that can apply deeper lesions, things that can uh, know the exact location of, uh, inside the heart. But if I think forward, and I think outside of just being limited to catheter ablation alone, I really want to make full use of all of the imaging modalities. I want to be able to combine all of the different beautiful images to identify where that scar location, the distribution of the scar, the architecture within the scar. I want to be able to bring in not just the scar, but the physiology of it, whether that be the metabolism or the electrophysiology. I'd like to pull all of those things together and ultimately be able to give a gap-free, full thickness type of ablation like we intuitively think we are doing. And of course, I'd like to do this by making it safer for the patient, too. And so we're going to finish up by kind of introducing the two concepts of non-invasive EP mapping, which we know quite well, and the non-invasive full thickness gap-free ablation, which is the stereotactic beam radiation. So ECGI is something that we've talked a lot about. I'm only giving you a slide or two about it. We all know the methodology quite well, I hope, at this point. Um, and ultimately, the type of result that you get in a single beat is this type of an isochrone map, where the earliest activation is in a red. So in one beat, I can get an idea of where the earliest activation of this uh, atrial uh, tachycardia is coming from. And if we do this, we've done this in ventricles in a number of different disease states, and that was published several years ago. So we've had a number of different disease states from a number of different areas within the heart. So I feel confident that we can localize where VT is coming from using this non-invasive tool. But if we can take it deeper, not just looking where VT is coming from, but how can we marry it to the other information that we have, and in particular, some of the fibrosis imaging that's becoming more and more popular, and can we correspond electrophysiology to this? And so here's the arterial side in red, the venous side is in blue, the phrenic nerve is in green, the endo and the epicardium are beautifully matched, and here's where the scar is. What's the electrophysiology going on in that scar? And we've been able to do this at times. So shown here is somebody who had sarcoidosis, and this is an anatomic and a metabolic map, and it's combined with non-invasive ECGI, uh, of that VT. So we see the VT is coming from the lateral uh, base of the left ventricle, and that's exactly where the inflammation is coming from here. So there's power in merging the electrical, the metabolic, and the anatomic type imaging. And beyond that, we can look deeper into the VT, not just where it's coming from, but this is a beautiful um, 
a paper that Junji uh, just published this past year. It really looks at some of the high definition features of the scar, where we can peer into the scar and see some very abnormal signals. So in sinus rhythm, we can see regions of low voltage, we can see regions of fractionation, and we can see late potentials. And so if I showed you this, this is a voltage map where the normal is in, in blue, the abnormal is going to be as we move towards red. So there are patches of scar just within that scar. You can see that the nuclear image showing this very large apical and anterior scar. And even within this scar, we can see things like fractionation and late potentials. And this is all in sinus rhythm in a single beat without putting catheters into the heart. You can really get a high definition snapshot of what's going on in this, this ventricle. And when we put them into VT, we can see the relationship of the VT to the scar. And so this is a uh, isochrone map of VT. You see the VT turning around here. It's moving through this region of scar, and that corresponds well to where the VT is exiting from. You can see the areas of late potentials within this map as well. And so this is a really powerful way to integrate your imaging of arrhythmias, and it shows the active biology of the scar. And it shows all of this, again, non-invasive medicine. So our VT ablation strategies as we've moved from 2010 to 2016 have said, well, maybe we shouldn't be spot shotters. Maybe we should ablate on the endocardium extensively and the epicardium extensively. But what we really want to do is this sort of thing. So once we've identified that scar, can we provide a gap-free, full thickness type of ablation? And I know I can't do it with the tools that I have, but I do have a friend who can. So Cliff, why don't you come up here and take it from here? All right, thanks for inviting me. Um, so again, you know, our, our worlds uh, merge in, in strange and unusual ways. When Phil first came to me, his question, my, my concern was, you know, how am I going to hit this tiny little four millimeter target in the beating heart? And his question to me was, how big can you hit? And I said, well, that's not a problem for me. <laughs> so um, we'll talk a little bit here. The first thing I wanted to do was just kind of, <clears throat> it's important you guys understand the language of arrhythmia. I wanted to give you a brief introduction into the language of, of what I do for a living. So uh, for the most part, when we're treating cancer, uh, we're using uh, photons, whether they be uh, x-rays or gamma rays, it's just all, all what's in the name, how, how the radiation source is generated. Um, but we have all the tools at our disposal, electrons, protons, um, you have to go to places like Japan to, to see, see these things like uh, heavy ions and carbon. But the, the issue is, is that they all have different ways of penetrating through tissue, delivering energy, depositing energy, um, and the, the language, or the, the, the tools that we use to deliver those um, are by and large linear accelerators. So, so there's a lot of different linear accelerators on the market. Um, they all generally work under the same principle. You accelerate an electron with an extremely high velocity, bang it into a tungsten target, make x-rays, um, and the, the, the energies that we're using typically are in the millions of electron volt range, so six to 18 million electron volt potential energy these you know penetrate through human beings to deposit those in tissue. And and the language that we use in terms of that absorbed dose is joules per kilogram on the gray. Um, this is for those who, who think back to the days of RADs, this is a hundred hundred RADs would be a gray. And at least for cancer, the primary target is DNA damage. So we're trying to create DNA double stranded breaks that don't get repaired, tumor dies. Um, and uh, probably not necessarily what we're seeing here in the cardiology side, but something that we're going to have to be investigating. And the other thing, too, that's important is that when you're looking at this and you pick up a paper or you read what we're doing here, we talk about the amount of grays of radiation we give. That's just only half the story. You also have to know how, how frequently we get it. So um, we'll talk about giving 25 gray of radiation. And if you give that in one big blast, it's highly damaging, very toxic, very ablative, um, versus breaking it up into little, into little doses. So again, you know, we, we talk about that in terms of fractionation, um, not the kind of fractionation you're talking about, the ECG potentials. Um, we can talk about conventionally fractionated radiation, which is what most patients get. It's breaking it up into small doses per day over several weeks with the idea that you've got a tumor in the middle of healthy tissue. You're just taking care of you're just exploiting biology. Um, normal tissues tend to repair themselves better than unhealthy tumorous tissues, uh, and so you, you're just taking advantage of what what was given to us. The, the big advance, however, has not been in conventionally fractionated radiation. It's been in so-called stereotactic radiation, which is where you're giving very high doses. These same doses, if delivered to the healthy tissues, like the brainstem or optic chiasm or spinal cord or up until recently the heart that I was trying to avoid treating, um, 
uh, are potentially very damaging. And so the way we get away with that is that it's been a perfect merging of, of just you know all the necessary components over the years. <clears throat> Faster computing power, power uh, better imaging, a better understanding of how to delineate targets and deliver these treatments. And so kind of an example of the workflow here is uh, the patient comes in, again, this is not under anesthesia, this is an outpatient treatment. Uh, they lay down into a device, there's many different kinds. The idea is just hold them still, don't let them move. We image them. Uh, in this case, this is a plan uh, that we're delivering a radiation treatment to the spine, and a stereotactic treatment to the spine. So again, multimodality uh, imaging. We then delineate the structures, uh, create a plan They're virtually in the treatment planning system to tell the machine how to rotate around the patient, in this case, delivering all these tiny little beamlets of energy using arcs of radiation, all prescribed down to that target, and then looking at measures of the quality of that plan by how rapidly the dose falls off uh, compared to where we want it to go. So to give you an idea, the green line is the prescription dose. Uh, the spinal cord, that same green line if delivered to the spinal cord would cause myelopathy or paralysis. So we're used to being able to hit pretty small targets in, in, in situations like this. Um, and, you know, moreover, what's kind of really exciting for me as a radiation oncologist is that despite the fact that these are very ablative and if delivered incorrectly could be harmful, um, we actually don't see a whole lot of uh, significant toxicity. And so this is an example of a patient with stage 1 lung cancer where we gave SBRT 54 grams refractions of this lesion. You can see over time it shrinks. This is not an immediate kill, something that you see with, art, with, with radiofrequency ablation. This takes time. Uh, but ultimately, this has become a, a significant viable option for the for patients that have medically inoperable stage one lung cancer, and we're now using it in all in all parts of the body. So, in terms of the preclinical data to date for doing this on purpose to the heart for purposes of treating arrhythmia, the data is limited, but it's out there. Um, essentially, it all it's, it's almost all uh, proof of principle mini swine models with the notion of can you target a part of the heart, can you hit it with radiation. Is there evidence that you hit it, whether it be sacrificing the animal, looking at histology, or looking at electrophysiologic changes? And you know, essentially summarizing a half dozen more abstracts or papers, it comes down to um, you need pretty high doses. So again, you know, 25 grade delivered in a single fraction. This is on the low end of what the recommended doses are that can produce electrophysiological effect. Two things to note: first, the same dose is a pretty big one for a tumor. Second three months. So again, not, not, not immediate in the, in the preclinical models. Um, and at least to try and recapitulate what we're seeing with radiofrequency ablation um, in, the, in the standard sense of creating fibrosis, again, this is a delayed effect. So again, showing this graphically, this is an example of a, a mini swine model where they were uh, imaged and then uh, treated with a radiosurgery system. This is again the intended uh, dose target right here. And then after sacrifice, you can see this area of scar, again, it takes you know, three to six months after treatment. And then this is a dose response curve, looking at this sharp threshold um, where you know uh, at low doses you don't see a lot of radiobiologic effect. Then at these higher doses, you start to see you know, minimal through complete fibrosis. Um, and again, you know, it may be that this is important for us to go to these higher doses, or it may be that some of the physiologic effect we see even happens at the lower doses. In terms of people that have been treated with this, the first in man treatment um, was done actually uh, close to 2010-11, but it took them a long time to report. So it was finally actually reported in 2015. Um, and this is a, a, a patient that received 25 grade in a single fraction. They were, uh, again, the kind of classic example of somebody who's unhealthy, not the best candidate for catheter ablation, not likely to tolerate a long um, catheterization. Um, and they, they delivered this treatment using um, a com combination of kind of their best guess using non-invasive imaging, um, a prior spec scan that they had, uh, and they delivered with something called the CyberKnife. The CyberKnife is um, a uh, just another type of linear accelerator. In this case, however, the CyberKnife requires the uses of fiducial markers. So not technically a totally non-invasive treatment because they actually had to flow the catheter in as a marker uh, to deliver the treatment. But nonetheless, proof of principle nonetheless, um, in this case, you can see that there was an effect, uh, mostly with the non-treated VT, um, but potentially also with the treated VT. This patient, like many of the unhealthy patients, went on to die of a COPD uh, related illness uh, several months later. Um, 
so this kind of all circles back to, to you know, what are, what are we trying to do uh, with our work? Um, merging the non-invasive imaging and the non-invasive treatment, doing it in a way that is logical, uh, that creates something where um, it recapitulates what we're kind of already doing on the cancer side, so we're not reinventing the wheel in certain ways. Um, the notion is, I ultimately need a target, and so the multimodal imaging and electrophysiologic, electrophysiologic imaging, bringing this all together so that we can essentially create, for me, a target. Um, we, when we first started making our protocol, uh, we use a language uh, called the GTV or gross tumor volume, and I realized that that's not going to fly, so we're just going to replace T for target instead of tumor. Um, so we don't want to freak the patients out. So um, ultimately, we create a target. Um, we then develop a plan. Again, in this case, normally I'm doing everything in my power to, uh, you know, if you're treating a cancer patient, I'm trying to treat the tumor next to the heart and avoid dose to the heart. In this case, I'm just shifting all that dose into the heart on purpose. Um, and then position the patient, mobilize them. And then the cool part is actually in the delivery. You know, uh, it, the system that we have at WashU and a lot of other places um, have onboard CT imagers. So we can image the patient right before we treat them uh, without the use of fiducials. So breaking that down into the individual components, um, this was the uh, first patient that we treated and it was uh, presented in a poster form at Heart Rhythm. Um, this is an example of that multimodal imaging. So again, the anatomic scar map. And using the information from ECGI, this patient had two different clinically distinct um, arrhythmias that we merged into one target. Uh, and then able to non-invasively localize, bring that into the treatment planning system. So again, first, immobilizing the patient. This is a pretty interesting system. Uh, this is actually a vacuum fixation system so that, you know, as far as the patient's concerned, they've been saran wrapped and vacuumed in place. Um, we're, for, the, for the protocol, we're using a different system where we're putting compression in their abdomen. It's the same thing. You really don't want that moving around during this treatment. Um, and then we got a special uh, type of CT s uh, scan called 4D uh, CT that allows us to take the uh, information from a bellows or external device that's watching them breathe and then oversample the CT data and then bin it back into the phases of breathing. And that allows us, this is something we use all the time for lung cancer planning so that we're not missing a target that's moving. So we take that information, and here again, this is the free breathing scan and the coronal view. Uh, this would be kind of an initial target that we draw, and you can see that uh, we can then bend the data into an inhale phase, exhale, and you can see how it's a moving target we don't want to miss. We take all that data, bring it into one maximum intensity projection, so we have the entire motion envelope. So again, we're not, in the, in the current version of, what, of the way we're treating patients, um, we're actually just treating the entire uh, area where the region could be. So it's not gating or targeting or turning the machine on and off yet. We're getting there, um, but that's what we're doing currently. So again, this is us sitting down, drawing out the target on the CT simulation. Um, and then the, the, the part that we're really excited about is we have proof of principle, we can take the ECGI data, threshold it um, uh, into a meaningful way that where it allows us to map where the origin of the ET is and then convert it back into a DICOM, which is a standard imaging format we're using uh, for you know, radiology images, and then bring it back into the treatment planning system, merge it with my images. And then this would be, for me, as a, as a you know, simple radiation oncologist, this would be the equivalent of me maybe bringing a PET scan to target tumor. Uh, and so this would be, this is a kind of an important step in that process. Take all that information, merge it together, uh, create a plan, uh, and again, the, this is all done, this isn't me sitting in front of a computer doing all of it, this is a team effort. So, so you know, Phil is uh, uh, responsible for the you know, merging mentally and then also from an imaging standpoint, bringing all the information together. I'm responsible for all the targeting and the anatomy uh, and then evaluating the plan, but there's actually the symmetrists and physicists um, uh, who, who are responsible for all the other aspects of the, the quality assurance and delivery. Um, and so in this case, you know, we're treating them with these ARC treatments, which are a very efficient way to get that dose in quickly. Evaluating the plan, again, I'm looking for dose that is highly conformable to the target, getting the prescription dose, and essentially the dose painting or dose sculpting, we call it, getting that dose in there right against the target, and then having a rapid fall off. Radiation's not magic. I can't make the radiation go in there and not radiate anything else. There's gonna be innocent bystanders nearby, um, and so there is dose uh, going to normal heart, but the idea is to minimize that as much as possible. 
Um, and this is just an example of what we call a DDA sure dose volume histogram that allows us to objectively measure the different doses to the different organs in the line. And then for the, the actual treatment, we bring them on, we put them back into that saran wrap, lay them on the table, get a CT on the on the fly. There's a machine, the actual linear already has the CT. We merge those two things, and then that tells the machine how to get it back into the proper position compared to the where they were on the day of simulation. We can take some additional fluoroscopic imaging. I went a little crazy with our first patient and added all these extra contours. We don't do this anymore. It's not that uh, egregious. Um, and you can actually watch them fluoroscopically, watch the, the heart and the diaphragm move, and then we treat. And uh, the treatment, you know, patients kind of come in, they get a little disappointed when they realize that there's no fireworks or light show. This is it. Nothing. They just lay there, they don't feel it, see it, smell it, hear it, they don't glow afterwards, they're not radioactive, <coughs> they don't turn into the Hulk, they don't set off detectors at the airport. They get up and they walk out. So with that, I'll pass this back to Phil to talk about some of the clinical results, and then we'll finish up with some future directions. Great, thanks, Phil. That's perfect. So we've done this on uh, eight patients now. The first five were in a pilot group uh, where it was taking it beyond proof of principle into actual treatment. And these were the worst of the worst. These are patients who had already failed multiple ablations or had contraindications to ablations, had failed multiple antiarrhythmic drugs, and were still having a lot of VT. And I won't go over the, the details of it, but these are the five patients. This is their gender. This is their types of cardiomyopathies. And I think most importantly, you can see the ablation volumes. We contour these volumes. And a, a golf ball is roughly, I think, 30 cc's. So you get an idea that we're contouring a, a golf ball worth of ablation here. And treatment times are 11 minutes to 18 minutes. Again, wide awake, they get on the scanner, they step off the scanner, as opposed to the eight hour treatments before. And we have fairly durable and long follow-up on these patients because obviously we're very curious about their well-beings. So after we do the treatment, we have every protocol in place to try to capture any type of VT. So I use the defibrillators to monitor for any heart rates that go above 100 beats per minute. Each two weeks that they come back to clinic, if they haven't had any more VT, we work on getting their antiarrhythmics off entirely so that the goal is to have them off antiarrhythmics by six to eight weeks. And we have built-in serial scans, both heart scans and lung scans, to look for other toxicities along the way. This is really the primary uh, image that I want to leave you with. This is each one of these bar graphs is in patient. And this is the number of ICD treatments they've had from three months, two months, and one month before treatment. Here's the treatment time. And you can see after treatment, there is a dramatic reduction, not an immediate reduction, but a dramatic reduction in VT treatments. But again, by six weeks to eight weeks, they are off antiarrhythmic medicines. We followed them out to 12 months and now beyond. Uh, patient four and five had, were in VT storm. They had well over 1,000 VT episodes in the months leading up to this. So it's a pretty dramatic sort of reduction. Um, getting somebody off antiarrhythmics is largely a difficult sort of thing and is usually not part of VT ablation trials that are out there. So this is really taken to uh, another level. Most standard VT ablation trials kind of cut off at six months as well. To be able to see this durable response to 12 months is particularly exciting. If we group the, the group together, look at the total number of ICD shocks in the months leading up to it and out, you can see it's a dramatic reduction. If we look at the other way that defibrillators can get patients out of the VT, that's anti-tachycardia pacing, those numbers were staggeringly high over the first month became less, and then ultimately nearly zero. And no matter how you really cut it, this is really a per patient look. This is from the defibrillator. This is a course over time from August 2015 to September 2016. I'm sorry, August 15 to September 16. Each of these bar graphs is a day where that patient had VT and was treated. And as you can see, the treatment was here. This patient did have a couple treatments in the week after. Those were just paste uh, terminated episodes. And you can see off antiarrhythmic medicines. And probably most telling is the quality of life that goes along with being VT free and being off medicine. And you can see this is patient activity per day. And gradually over the course of time, this patient went from being essentially bed bound to doing quite a bit more. So it's really a telling sort of story, I think. And the results, no matter how you cut it, is that everybody, all five patients, had a significant reduction in VT. And whether we look at it in aggregate, so 6,500 episodes in the 15 patient months before to three VT episodes after the six-week blanking period. So that's a pretty substantial reduction. We can look at it per patient, and the numbers are equally impressive. And three patients were entirely VT-free off of medicines at that one year.
So it's pretty substantial. And, and at what cost are we delivering this? Are we just trading short-term risks for longer-term toxicities? It's entirely possible. Both Cliff and I worry that we're causing cardiac damage that's going to be beyond just the arrhythmia story, but could we be causing more of a, a toxicity for the cardiac myocytes and overall cardiac performance? And it doesn't appear to be that way. So we've had serial echoes at one month, three months, 12 months for the patients, and you can see it's largely been the same. Overall, I think it was a 6% improvement for all. But in particular, the two patients who had the most VT, when the VT went away, the ejection fractions improved rather dramatically. And so there doesn't seem to be, at least at one year, a risk of cardiac damage that uh, exceeds uh, what we would normally expect for a natural history. We've also done CAT scans over the course of time, and at three months and at 12 months, this is the area that we targeted in blue, and you can see that there's a, a bit of fibrosis behind this area that largely disappears by 12 months. Cliff tells me that this is common for treatment of lung cancer. So the mid lung fibrosis seems to be minimal, and it certainly doesn't seem to be a major issue at 12 months. So we still have much to learn, and there's ways to do this. But in particular, if we lump all the things that we want to learn, we want to understand the safety of this first and foremost. We're delivering radiotherapy that could have potential bad effects into the heart, into the body. We want to really understand that and understand the, the, the injury to the surrounding structures as well. We like to really learn cardiac radiobiology. We don't know much about that biology. And, and how is it anti antiarrhythmic? Is it just fibrosis? I would argue that there seems to be more. If the antiarrhythmic effect seemed to be in the first several weeks, it's unlikely that fibrosis would have been laid down that quickly. So there seems to be more to this cardiac radiobiology and the effect that we see. And are there opportunities to do this better? And how should we deliver that treatment? I showed you all the different ways that people can have VT1 and VT2 in different locations. Should we be ablating the entirety of the scar, or should we be targeting just the areas where the VT are now? And what is too much ablation? Um, and, and how do we really understand this biology? And, and can we do it better? Are there ways to compensate for motion? Are there ways to, to look at the breathing or look at the cardiac motion and ways to deliver this in a safer way? So Cliff, do we have those answers? <laughs> Thanks. We had to flip a coin for who gets to do the end of the cool pictures. Um, so right now we've got a prospective trial that we're really proud that we were able to open recently. Um, it's a phase one, two study um, and uh, uh, 19 patients. It's a, a combined goal of uh, co-primary endpoints. So to be efficient with this delicate population, we wanted to have enough patients to try and answer these early questions, um, but not, uh, not too much unnecessarily expose this, this, this population. So we've got really, really powerful early stopping rules for toxicity, uh, data safety and monitoring um, committee that will be re meeting on a regular basis. Um, and we set a relatively low bar for efficacy. You know, like in a, in a, one of the things I have to keep reminding Phil when I'm talking with him is that, you know, if we, if we see somebody where their VT recurs and we don't have a, you know, 100% effect, that we have to think about that in my world, where on the oncology side, you get a 5% improvement in survival at the cost of $30,000 a month for a drug, and we call that a win. Yeah, so we're, you know, we're, we're, we're bankrupting the Medi Medicare. That's, that's our fault, so you guys have less to work with. Um, so so in, that, in that vein, you know, we're setting a, an efficacy where, you know, on the high-risk uh, refractory population, where we want at least a 40% response rate. But importantly, we're trying to maximize our, our use of these patients. So we're trying to do multimodal imaging, uh, pre and post treatment, look at biomarkers, um, and I'm, I'm uh, pleased to say that we've actually enrolled five patients to date, treated three, and uh, two are actively working on here hours before this talk today. So there are many opportunities and obviously future directions. There's a lot we need to learn, as Phil just mentioned. On the preclinical side, we just really don't have the time to go into this. Just know that we're, we're actively engaged in trying to, to work with animal models, um, and then also looking at the, on the occasion where patients go to heart transplant, taking advantage of the fact that we're going to have that tissue that we can look at, at least from a histopathologic standpoint. On the delivery side is where I'm, I get nerded out and I get really excited by it because we have some things here at WashU that pretty much nobody else in the world has. I'll show you some pictures of that in a second. Um, and then the uh, same thing from a targeting. You know, we want this to be a soup to nuts. If this is going to take off, if it's going to be something that we really end up doing more of, it can't just be, you know, two kind of crazy people who are willing to sit together for hours at a time and work, we need to make this so that the masses can accept it as well. So the first thing I'll show you is we have something called the ViewRay, or Meridian is the name of the system. Um, and it's a first of its kind MR-guided radiotherapy treatment unit. 
Um, it is a 0.35 Tesla MRI. Um, it's uh, uh, cobbled together from the, uh, intra -op the original intraoperative MRIs, where there would be, a, it's called a double donut MRI, and there's all this equipment between the two sides of the MRI. This, like only the thin surgeons could operate in those areas. <laughs> and uh, so uh, in the first iteration of it, it's uh, cobalt-based. And cobalt's actually an old technology that we used back in the day. In this case, it has a lot of appeal um, uh, because of the right hand rule. So when you're trying to make linear accelerators and electrons flow through magnets, there's very big problems that go with that. Um, so the first iteration is cobalt. Uh, we were the first uh, site in the world to have this, first people to treat with it, and it was developed by somebody who was trained at WashU and went on to make the spin-off company when they told them that it was impossible. So what we're really interested in is obviously MR is a great way to image the heart. Obviously, we have one very specific problem to deal with, and it's this guy. Um, and so we're working with uh, Pam Woodard and others to, to understand protocols where we can, particularly as patients get more MR conditional phasers in place where we can make this safe, um, but then also image properly. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've been able to image patients, normal volunteers, uh, and, image, and even image one of the few patients that we had that did not have a pacemaker who we treated with PVCs. Um, and this is kind of an example of what you can get with a low field MRI in real time. The important thing is not the fact that we can do an MRI. People doing MRIs for a long time, you guys have some really beautiful images of that. The important thing is that we can use this in real time to treat and track a patient. So um, I mentioned that right now, I have to treat the entire motion on the boat. I have to think where that area of the heart might be at any given time, and since I can't see it, since it's the moment that I start treating, I shut off all my imaging, I have to treat everything. And you know, with volumes, things expand rapidly. For every millimeter of uh, radial dimension, I'm increasing the volume proportionally much greater. And so when we talk about minimizing exposure to healthy tissues, being able to image in real time, track in real time, treat in real time, um, could be a real game changer for something like this. So this is a future next step forward uh, that we're really excited about. The other thing I mentioned is this quote, fully integrated system. So it's kind of the top half of our, of our figure that we scatter throughout our talks. It's this notion of Right now, multimodal imaging and ECGI is processed by a specific supercomputer inside Phil's brain right now. <laughs> um, and so uh, we, you know, for all I know, Phil might leave one day. So we have to have software to be able to do this. And so um, we've worked really hard on trying to think of, you know, all the different approaches to doing that. Um, and have been fortunate that we uh, recently submitted a patent um, looking at uh, different ways to bring in multimodal imaging for a total soup to nuts non-invasive treatment system. Um, and then uh, there was a recent uh, LOI that went out, which almost seems tailored for us. So of course, too good to be true. So we'll you know, see what happens. Which was a collaborative science award through the American Heart Association, specifically looking at different um, uh, 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 categories of physicians working together uh, to try and solve heart issues. Uh, so we're very excited and very proud for that. So with that, we'll wrap it up. I think we stayed somewhat on time. I want to acknowledge all the different people that we've worked with over the t over time. Um, uh, as you can see, the great part about this is that it's not all one department. It's throughout radiation oncology, uh, cardiology, Dr. Rudy's lab, radiology, etc. Um, I'll, I'll tell you how to spell Sasha's name later. Dr. Budic, who's sitting back there, um, who's the head of the director of physics in my department, and was kind enough to to bridge the divide and come over here. And so with that, I guess we'll take questions. Stacy. Awesome. I have a, I have a great, um, just about the hypothesis about it being the actual scar tissue that's where you want to be. Um, how about in your animal studies, when you give the radiation, doing ECGI afterwards, whether you have some immediate like change in uh, the refractory periods and you know, the basic intrinsic properties of the myocytes, because it's well known that things like radiation can reprogram cell gene expression. Yes. So perhaps you could give a lower dose without actually causing cell death. Would you like to come work with us? <laughs> yeah, no, we've had countless conversations about this very thing, and there's no doubt that it's not just fibrosis. I mean, if it was just fibrosis, that takes three to six months to happen patients are, you know, seeing an effect earlier on. So what that is, is if you determine, it's really funny you mentioned that one thing about gene 
you know, uh, changing Gene's expression, because back when Gene chips were hot and sexy and everyone was doing that, you know, we even found some old data that showed that ionizing radiation has pretty significant, relatively early changes on expression of, you know, sodium and potassium channels. So, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. the, I, 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 can, yeah. I know about that literature. Yeah. I mean, to yeah. me, that's what I think, if I just listen to your story, yeah. that, Absolutely. And, and I'll tell you too, Stacey, um, in the, the opportunities that we've had to see the hearts, so one guy did go for a heart transplant 18 months later, and so with the opportunity to see his heart, it was much less um, ablated than you would have expected. There was much less destruction than I would have expected for somebody to see that long of an antiarrhythmic course. Um, so I, I think that this may actually potentially be a primary um, cause of the antiarrhythmic effect here, uh, that you may not need to just destroy everything. There may be a, a reprogramming. We should at least be open to that possibility in the studies that are going forward. That makes sense, because you don't have to get as much radiation. Right, right. In fact, we don't even know that delivering in a one big dose is the way to do it. That was done specifically because the early hypothesis was, let's try and, let's try and recapitulate what RFA is doing. And the best way to do that is one big monster dose. But it turns out that's not the biology. But actually, some modest fractionation would be the way to go. And as soon as you start fractioning, and as soon as I start lowering down the dose per day, I start increasing the safety set threshold greatly to the surrounding cardiac tissue. So you know, that, that might be another approach we have to take. It's just really not very well studied. So, so uh, thank you for this presentation. But the question that I have, and I'm glad you addressed the motion issue, because I raised it in the context of the manuscript. And I think it's an important question. The other thing is the scar is not only inhomogeneous with regards to myocytes, but it has all kinds of structure that are important to cardiac function away from the scar. There are neural inputs, there is conduction system, there are blood vessels. All of those go through the scar. And some of them survive and function even when the scar is there. Now you're going to destroy the whole thing in a homogeneous fashion, and you'll be destroying those structures also that affect behaviors of cardiac muscle somewhere else. Maybe synchrony, maybe blood flow, maybe neural, all of those. And, and that would be difficult to track and, and, and evaluate. So I wonder if you thought about that. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a usually it's a terrific point. Um, I think as we've gone into this, uh, always the first line of, of our discussion has always been on the safety aspect of this, because this is just not, this is just not the conventional way of delivering radiotherapy. Um, this is widely thought to be a dangerous way of delivering radiotherapy. And we just don't know that scar biology as well as I think we should. Uh, even, in, even in catheter ablation, we put our catheters there and we ablate, but, but we, we give great, um, radiofrequency energy like we would for normal tissue, but scar tissue behaves differently. There are different structures to it. There are different pieces to it, different components to it. And so we've really racked our brains in terms of trying to figure out what is going to be that next ultimate preclinical study. Now, the preclinical studies that have been done are largely dose ranging, dose effect sort of things, looking for ablation, but I, I think this is really and important. Part of piece the point is that the end point, guess arrhythmia and arrhythmia is not the entire it's, story. It's not everything, yeah. And that's why I think the, the close tracking afterwards of cardiac function, we actually have a, we're going back deeper into these echoes and looking to see if we can see regional differences in terms of where we treated versus not, looking at strain rate imaging and, and speckle tracking and things like that to try to get an idea of the regionality of the, of the changes that happen. Is it truly localized or is there a global component to it? So I think that would be important to include I don't know if they were included in what you called biomarkers for the study that you're yeah. preparing and so on. But, but I think some of those observations beyond the scar are probably important. I think they are. So you think you're getting the McKinsey system? You see any widening or QRS or anything after you do this? That's a good question. For most everybody, we have not. Um, I can't think of a single one where we've seen something pick up. With the exception of the His bundle, uh, with AV node, so the AV node. So um, the first patient, the ablation was very close to the AV node, uh, and he actually had a lengthening of his PR interval in the first two days, three days, uh, and then it came back to normal. So we weren't intentionally targeting his AV node; we were near it. 
you know, probably received 15 to 20 gray based on what I could see in the, the maps that we did if everything was accurate. And there seemed to be an effect in the first three days or so that was not durable. Uh, one of the patients we intentionally treated that region, he had had five different ablations up along uh, his LV septum, and uh, we intentionally targeted that. He had a biventricular pacemaker in already, so it wasn't going to be that big of a deal if he did go into heart block, and indeed he did go into heart block. But his wasn't till four weeks out, as best as we can tell, that his heart block happened. Outside of the AV note, we've not seen any QRS getting wide. So has anybody done any, I know you pointed to one animal study where they've done animal studies to look at the evolution of these, these stars or anything? Not really, no. Yeah. It's, it's to say that is, is that's disingenuous of the study. It's, it's a single sacrifice at various points of time with various doses. So it wasn't very rigorously done. It wasn't as if they do 30 gray and checked, you know, sacrificed animal at day 14, at day 28, and, and, and didn't sequentially do that. It was, it was very scattershot in terms of that. So I think that's a very important question. That's, that's kind of the very first question that we would say. So what's the right dose and what's the right time to expect to see EP effects of that dose? And I would say we still largely don't know. What type of BT are you targeting in your initial trial? Because as you can imagine, right, if it's Rantrend versus that's the side of the trigger, you know, does this treat both? Or are you, so are you going just after those patients who you think this is where triggers are coming from? Mm -hmm. No, um, we've opened up to all right now, because I don't know if this is going to be better for one or worse for another. I, I don't know. So it's really anybody who's failed medical treatment and, and catheter ablation or, or is contraindicated to catheter ablation. So, so, so in, far it worked in both cases. In the pilot study, right, we've seen it in, in focal and we've seen it in reentry mechanisms. Um, in particular, you know, we, we struggle with non-ischemic cardiomyopathies yeah. predominantly because that scar tends to be fairly diffuse. Uh, I don't know if this would be a better way or a worse way to treat that, but in the non-ischemics that we have treated so far, you know, things have looked good, but <coughs> obviously very early it needs to be further worked on. So this how about epicardial versus, you know, mid-myocardial or endocardial VT? Yes. I would say that um, based on the way that we conform the volumes, we treat the entire thickness of it. So it's being treated from endocardium to epicardium, so it's not we're not at the point where we have the accuracy to just pinpoint target just the endocardium as it's moving. So we treat the entirety of the thickness. And that may have some value too. It may have some harm. I, we don't know. It's, it's worth it's worth studying. Um, Sorry? Is there any I'm not sure. Sorry, so go ahead, go ahead. So I guess so um, I guess so. I guess once you go beyond, I guess the first things would be so a lot of unanswered questions. So first of all, uh, excellent talk. Um, the thing is sort of, I guess if you don't know the biology, I guess to me, it's still sort of far-fetched to think it is all be programming, because I would have still thought, I guess at least that was the hypothesis one that you'll induce fibrosis. And again, sort of, if they're not actively replicating tumor cells, and I guess I don't know how that, what you thought you have in terms of what the biology could be, or how it could lead to fibrosis down the road. Um, but I guess so if it goes beyond this, and if you want to sort of, the holy grail would be to treat all arrhythmias non invasively, right? So in that, what it means is you have to sort of target to even more smaller sort of, uh, sort of um, fidelity and sort of smaller targets. So do you see, uh, what, I guess, what changes would, or how would this evolve into that? Uh, is this the right radiation source, or do you think some other kind of radiation source would allow you to sort of target it more specifically and, with gating? And, and let's, full disclosure, you're asking from Mayo, so he did graduate from Mayo. Yeah, so. sure, okay, fair enough. So, a great question, though. I yeah. think that's very important. So, let me, let, me, um, let me work backwards on that. So, in terms of the delivery, I felt like that our very first goal with this was don't miss, right? Mm -hmm. So, if we didn't see a signal, and we didn't know whether it's because we were doing, we were getting too cute with the targeting, that would have been a really big deal. So, what we're doing now in terms of treating these kind of large, robust areas is not necessarily what we have to do. <clears throat> so, you know, whether it's MR guidance or whether it's uh, respiratory correlated gating, where we can actually, um, you know, visualize on the patient how they're breathing and then correlate it with the 40 CT. There's a lot of different ways that we can track and, and gate and treat uh, targets. And we can treat really small areas. So when I treat someone with brain metastasis, I can treat something that's like two to three millimeters um, uh, and, and hit it. <laughs> uh, so 
I'm not too worried about where we might end up going if, if I need to treat a smaller target. Um, uh, I, I do think that there are you know, some, some hurdles, but they're all surmountable. Uh, the main issue is that other groups have gone straight to the AFib story, because they see the market potential in a much larger number of patients. And I think that we appropriately went away from that, go after the life-threatening condition, go after the people that don't have, this is a story that we've done for everything we've done radiation oncology, by the way, with SPRT. Go after the, the, the patients that surgeons can't operate on, don't horn in on that territory. Um, with AFib, it, you know, we know for sure that radiation can cause things like fistulas, right? And you can get that when you RF near the esophagus, and I can certainly do that with radiation. So, you know, that's something we could eventually get to. And, I, and again, back to the biology issue. I mean, that's a huge, huge, huge topic. I mean, I, we, we're really excited about engaging the community and seeing if we can, you know, get those studies going because there is so much more that needs to be done here. It's like a little bit, it's almost a teaser of biology treat the patients and then backing back into the biology. And so again, sort of, so you sort of briefly mentioned sort yeah. of other heavier particles and so forth. Yeah, well, so protons, carbon, whatever. So I mean, listen, we, we, can, we can do all of it. So there's, there is very little additional value, I think. Um, so here's the thing about protons, which I know was very exciting, or carbon. You know, you go to Heidelberg or Japan and you can take carbon. It's a charged particle and it stops. So we have a proton unit here. We get a lot of referrals because protons are magic and they make everything better. Um, the issue is, is that protons are extremely, extremely, all charged particles are extremely sensitive to the intervening tissue that's in the way. So any amount of motion, unlike an x-ray, the motion kind of blurs out. You know, there's not a, there's not a huge difference between lung tissue interfaces with x-rays. But protons, that can make you off target by centimeters. So when you can take a heat beating heart and take it ex vivo and treat it in a, you know, an artificial environment like that, it actually works pretty well. Um, but hey, maybe, maybe someday we'll be able to target protons better. The, theor the theoretical advantage to that is, again, because it stops and they don't keep going, in theory that means I would have less damage to the surrounding part. But practically, I think we're a little far away. So again, with the biology, um, yeah. if you just do some ECGI in addition to your PET and MRI mm -hmm. in those patients, you may be able to detect, you know, some subtle changes there that would then give you kind of a yeah. rationale for a grant to <laughs> that's, study we've, why. We've done repeat ECGIs on the five pilot patients as much as we can at the one year, and it's built into the phase one, phase two as well. Okay. So they've got repeat PETs uh, at the short and medium course, they've got repeat MRIs at the short and medium course, and they've got repeat CGIs and I think the medium and longer term follow-ups. And so there are some ways that we're going to serially look through that. Yeah, I agree. It's important. It's an important if you question. see something, then that's you know, a good rationale for, because there is a lot of literature about radiation and altering you know, mm -hmm. that genome and kind of blasting things back to where they should be because local cues will kind of uh, reset the yeah, and I, it would be nice to do that on a molecular level. ECGI is on the, you know, on the structural level. Uh, it would be nice to know what that, what those changes are on the, on the you know, more molecular and cellular levels. When you give the dose, do you have to worry about the pacing leads when they have ICDs and devices? Do you have to, or I mean, does that scatter the, no, the dose not, at all? No, not really. So when you're when you're working with photons that are at the 6 to 18 million electron volt potential energy, it, it barely even sees that. Because the electron density of that material is such and it's so small that there's very little. We account for it in our treatment planning system, so the treatment planning system can model the effects of the electron density of those leads. Um, and if we needed to, we could account for it. It really doesn't affect it. The main issue actually for us is actually the pacer, the generator. So um, when you go to higher energies, you end up with actually a neutron scatter. The neutrons are are actually kind of, they're pretty damaging, actually, the, the, the laser equipment. Um, so what we do is we, we do a simulation as part of the planning. Part of the physics checks are to actually um, uh, assess what the dose to that is going to be. Um, and then we actually check the integrity of the pacer before and after treatments. We have one of the reps come down. Um, it's something we do for all patients for cancer, too. We have plenty of patients we treat with cancer without pacing. So do you, do you have any concerns it'll damage the battery or anything like that? No, actually, uh, the delivery itself we're not worried about. The, the actual delivery is, is point on, and it's, you know, I, sh I showed you that we can actually take the dose gradient 
from prescription down to half of the prescription and then a couple of millimeters. So centimeters away is almost zero uh, direct dose. Um, so it would just be scattered uh, to the electrical equipment. It's not something direct. The main issue is, the main issue is going to be on the MR side if we end up creating an MR. All right, friends. The hour is getting yeah. late. Thank you very much for your time. Cliff and I are happy to talk about this more, though. If you have other questions, thoughts, you know, ways that you want to collaborate, let us know. But thank you for your time.